Oh, um, yes. Because Diane temporarily is, uh, is nothing else. I want to introduce Leslie Graff, who holds a bachelor's and master's degree from Brigham Young University. Uh, spends her time working on acrylics, and as you can tell, she started here and mixed media while exploring a variety of, of series. Her work is unified by a shared theme, the complexity of human experience. It explores identity, relationships, connection, influence, and specifically the intangibles of fraud and emotion. Uh, she's, her work has been featured in many places, including Good Housekeeping, HGTV, uh, Profile on Forbes.com, Boston Bowl and featured on Inquiry on NPR. And she's currently and still um, part of the faculty at the Danford Museum Art School. Uh, she's taught creative arts in California, Utah, Massachusetts, and Virginia, and lectures frequently, and she currently lives in the South. So let's leave. Okay. One, that's probably what I consider the thing of greatest value that I can give you. And two, because I fell down my stairs a week ago and hurt my shoulder. And so I'm trying not to do this as much, but actually when I'm home, I tend to paint flat. I don't know how many of you do that, but I prefer painting flat because it's a lot less, like when you do it all day, every day, it's a lot less on your back. And especially if you paint acrylics, you don't have to worry about touching it because it dries. So, I actually love to paint flat, and I often paint on the floor, which at 46 I should probably stop, stop doing. But um, I'll walk you through a little bit of my process, a little bit of the series that I brought tonight. Um, so, most of my time now is spent as a studio artist. I teach one class, usually per session, for the Danforth Museum. I teach independent painting. I had students who started with me as beginners, and over six years they've just stayed in state and state. So, um, so I teach independent painting, but I really love teaching um, from the time my students leave beginner. Um, I have them selecting their own projects. I don't like to like set up a still life that everyone has to paint because I believe that choosing your own subjects and finding your own voice should start really early in that process, and that you can learn all of the skills that you need to learn within the context of those projects, right? If you need to develop the skills in contrast or value, then you choose a subject that's high in contrast and value, but something that has meaning to you and something that has significance to you. So, um, so I love to spend time teaching. My background is actually in education and developmental psychology, <coughs> and um, my graduate degrees are in that. I was also a child life specialist, so doing therapeutic play in clinical settings. So I have a very unusual background um, as an artist, but for me, it really strengthens my work. There's always things that I want to say, things that I want to talk about in my work. Um, I would say that my work is less about making a statement and more about asking questions or allowing people to approach things from different points that kind of can be in conflict um, or that can exist simultaneously within a piece. So um, I show at Arden Gallery on Newbury Street. Um, they, that's where most of my domestic series goes now. Um, I also do a lot of commission work and work directly <coughs> with clients, corporate clients. In the pandemic, I did six giant pieces for Delta for the new Salt Lake Airport. Um, so it's a, it's a really fun job to have as an artist, and I love it. Um, this series, people always ask me about, so that's why I brought it, um, is a really interesting series. And the way that this series came about, one day I was wearing this apron, and I was sweeping my kitchen, and I was dressed up because I was coming from somewhere. And it was these aprons that my great-grandmother had embroidered. And living in Idaho in like 1940. And I thought, you know what, it's so funny. I bet she swept her kitchen wearing this same apron. And how is her life then so different from my life now? Like what is the same and what is different? 
And so I thought it'd be really interesting to do this painting where you didn't really know if it was me or if it was her, right? I had this mid-century table in my breakfast nook. So there were sort of these elements that sort of blurred the historical context of the piece. And you couldn't totally tell who it was. And I liked that ambiguity of the piece because I liked that it could speak to her experience and my experience that were very different, but at the same time had similarities. And so I did that piece and I really liked it. And I was like, you know, I want to take another one of these aprons and do another piece. So I did another one and I really liked it too. And it was interesting, but again, I liked the ambiguity because I think anytime you're painting a portrait, people look at it and they decide either, I like this person, I know this person, I think this person is attractive, right? You, and you can't identify in the same way necessarily um, as you can with a figure, whereas people will often say, this reminds me of my mother, or this reminds me of my grandmother. However, if it had a face on it, they would be much less likely to make that connection. And at the same time that I started painting these, I had little children. Um, and it was kind of funny, after I did the third one, my second son was like, Mom, I can go get you another canvas to put on top because you keep <laughs> running out of room for the heads. And so he's like, I have a solution for you. And I was like, no, no, it's this way on purpose. And what I really liked, too, was the focus on domestic work. And each of the pieces, they generally have sort of loaded titles, and there's some sort of metaphor or analogy in the action that the woman is doing. And so I also like that as my children watch me do things, they're seeing what I do. So I like an, a, a focus on the action. And domestic work is not something that's especially depicted in art, right? Like maybe the potato peelers painting, but there's really not a lot that goes there. And so having studied a lot about sort of domestic work, identity, these things, it was kind of interesting to me. And I loved sort of these objects and how I could sort of use these sort of objects or artifacts that I had in my home that also connected me to different times and places. And again, sort of blurred the context. And what was I saying in these pieces? Um, what were they saying about the experiences of women? Um, so again, people are like, well, you cut the heads off. Like, you know, are you like hypersexualizing the bodies of the women? But for me, it's not, um, for me, it's ultimately retaining the power of the woman, right? Because you can't see her face. You don't know what she's thinking. You don't know what she's feeling. Like you can make whatever assumptions you want, but ultimately she is the only person who knows what she thinks and what she feels and gets to decide what is going on in that moment. And so I really like that because I am a really big believer in the sort of intimacy of the mind. We all have so many thoughts and experiences that no one ever hears or knows. They just will only live forever in our own minds and experiences. So I really like to create pieces that have this tension in them when people approach them. The first thing is like, why don't they have pets? <laughs> and as I started this series, right, I did three paintings that it was sort of like, well, a friend of mine was like, these are really cool. You need to, like, don't sell these yet. Like, I want you to do at least 10 of them. And I was like, oh, I don't know, but maybe I'll do it. And so I did, so I was like, okay, I won't sell any of them until I do, like, 10. Well, then I ended up doing 30 and doing a show. But most of them were sold before I even did the show because I was like, I can't sell them until, so they all had these little pre-reservations. But it was really fun to explore the theme. And I, I reached this point where I had to decide, was I going to hire models, what was I going to do? And as I thought about the experience I wanted to convey, I really liked using a feminist framework and sort of speaking from a first person experience. So I was like, it's just going to be me. I'm going to use myself in every one of these pieces. You know, if I weigh more, if I weigh less, because there's, you know, having children this time, like, I wanted an authentic, real body, not someone's body that I just picked because I thought it looked good or I thought it looked nice. And I don't edit the body, you know, like I'm not going to Photoshop out. I was just going to present the body as it was. And I really liked that. And just logistically speaking, it was much easier to kick out a photo shoot when my child was taking a nap if I didn't have to get someone else to arrive at just the right time and have just the right size clothes that could fit them. I could just go in the closet and if that outfit wasn't working, I could change it to something else. 
Um, and I liked the intimacy of using my spaces and my objects and the things that were personal to me because I feel like we can speak much differently from our own experiences than when we're projecting or saying things about other people's experiences. And it really like authenticity. The funny thing is people who know me will will see something and they'll be like, oh, you wore those shoes last week. And they'll be like, yes, yes, I did. And they'll be like, that's your dining room table. That's like, so they are places. Um, the only one that's not in my house is, that was my parents' house, but that was like a little TV. I remember watching like moving the antenna and watching shows up when I was little. And so I love that they have this connection, but sort of explores um, I think especially the challenges and experiences of women and how they have changed through the decades and sort of holding both um, the tensions of opportunity, things we've gained, things we've lost. Um, and so I like to sort of honor that and explore that at the same time. You know, I think about my grandmother who always wanted to be a fashion designer. But instead, she got married and lived in a small town in Idaho, and didn't that wasn't going to be an opportunity in her life. She ended up; they owned a fabric store, which sort of allowed her a chance to design dresses and sew things, but at a certain compromise that really was what life was um, for women of her generation. And but I'm so grateful for also the investments that she made in her family because I came as a part of that. And so the ways that we can both hold these tensions of um, sometimes maybe sacrifices or disappointments with also opportunities or rewards that come out of our individual experiences that are sometimes filled with both, you know, sometimes ambiguity or um, those conflicting emotions um, or conflicting experiences. So that's sort of philosophically where these pieces come out of. Um, I have other series as well. So I've done a whole series of big cakes, which actually came out of, I was doing a domestic and um, I was like, I like painting the cake more than I like painting any other part of this. So I was like, I think I'm gonna do a series of cakes. Um, and so they were really fun, and they're fun because they're big, I have to make the cake, then I have to eat the cake, <laughs> just as a part of the process, and, um, and, those, and they're really fun, again, sort of exploring different issues. So um, we'll sort of give you a little bit of context. So this one that I brought that I just drew up today, she's on the phone, and I really love corded phones. I have an old phone booth in my studio, I have a whole collection of old phones. But to me, there's something about, I mean, I love having a cell phone, but for those of us who lived through the age of regular phones, landline phones, there was this element of, um, that I love, that I remember you would go somewhere and sometimes you'd be like, did somebody try to call? This was before, you know, you had to answer your machine. It's like, if someone tried to call you, you missed it, right? There was this, there was a different sense of time. Um, or the ability to miss things. And so I love to use phones, both because there's really fun plays on words between like um, her call or um, like the power you have or the voice that you have when you're using a phone, right? You're getting, you're getting to say something or connect with someone. But to me, there are also a lot about emotional presence, right? The way that it used to be you could miss a call you can miss being present in things in your life and it just passes and it's gone and you don't get that part back. And so I like phones as a symbol of emotional presence for me. So other objects too, I like to embed these different things in. So um, when I first did my series of cakes, the first one I did is this big chocolate cake and it's cut so you can like a piece is taken out of it. It's chocolate frosting, yellow cake, big strawberries, and it has this green patterned background, which was actually the wrapping paper my grandparents had in their fabric store in the 1950s that they would use to wrap all of the packages in. And I had this piece of it. My Christmas presents always had come wrapped in that. So I liked, again, sort of incorporating this element into it. It has this reflective black cake tender in it. But the title of the piece is You Want a Piece of Me. So it's somewhat like feels provocative or what are we saying like really literally you would want to eat a piece of the cake but
but it was really about the fact that there's sort of 24 hours in a day, right? You could divide this cake into big pieces or small pieces, but there, at the end of the day, there's just so much cake. And I find constantly, I'd say especially in our modern society, there's so many things that want your attention in a day. And it's about really deliberately deciding who gets my time. Like, all these things are asking for a piece of you, and you have to decide every day where that is going. Um, I did another piece that's this bun cake under this, you know, glass cake dome, and it has this polka dot background, and it's titled Glass Ceiling, so it's about <laughs> but very literally a cake with a glass ceiling. So I really like the ways that we can create metaphor and meaning by utilizing everyday objects. And I think often that's something that we underutilize and I constantly challenge my students to do is, sure, anything can just be pretty or just be nice to look at, but the minute that you give it a different that piece for me, I always listen to music when I'm in the studio, so I love music, and from a therapeutic standpoint, I think music companions us a lot. It sort of is like little release valves of emotions as we hear someone else like talk about a specific flavor of an emotion or an experience. We relate to that or we connect to that, and that helps us to be more emotionally healthy. But I also love the mixtapes because I grew up in that era that like, I knew eight tracks and records, and then we went to like cassettes, and then we went to CDs, and then we went to MP3s. And sometimes, again, like in our lives, in the sequence of events, we are the mixtapes, right? Things come after us that might be better, but there's still something special about what that was, or you enabled the next good thing to come along. You helped progress to occur. Right? If we didn't get to this, we couldn't get to this. And, and so sometimes there's those compromises or those elements within our experience. So I love to paint in all different series, and I'm the first person to tell you, you do not have to have one style. I've never had a curator or a gallery owner tell me to stop painting my other things. In fact, um, I, a good example was I was doing a big exhibit for the Newport Art Museum and the curator came over to the studio to pick the works for the exhibit. And she came in and she was like, I didn't even know you painted cakes. Like the cakes would be perfect because this exhibit is all about domestic life. So I don't just want domestics, I want cakes too. And so it was so validating and I think so important because too many of us feel like I can only paint in one thing or real artists only paint in one style. And from a commercial standpoint, it's much better to have multiple lines of work because some people might like this series and some people might like this series. And for me, I would get really burned out if I only painted one thing. Like it can get really formulaic if I'm just, I mean, at this point I've probably painted a hundred different domestic paintings, but I could be like, okay, get out skin color, or you know, like how many times do I painted the legs, right? Like, it's, so you need that challenge and switching for me back and forth between styles or series really helps to propel my work when I then come back into that series, right? Because you've kind of been painting with a different technique, with a different focus, and so it sort of shifts as you then move back into another style. So I really am a big believer in shifting materials, shifting series, trying to make work that looks like nothing you've ever made before, right? I do a lot of just playing. I do like exchange sketchbooks with friends where you do 15 pages and then you send it to them, they do 15 pages and send it back to you. It's just nonsense playing with whatever scraps and things you have around the studio. In fact, for me, it's like, how crazy can I make these pieces? How different can I make them? What little themes, kind of like short stories, right? doesn't have to be developed like a novel. You just play with some little idea, some little element um, to make it interesting. So, um, and as I said, if anyone has questions or anything you want to know, who takes pictures? Okay, so who takes the pictures? It started out with me taking the pictures with the remote control and the camera on the tripod and you have like a three second delay to like throw it down and then get into a pose or like stick it down your shirt or something so that you can get the shot. Now, 
Sometimes I con my children into doing it, now that they're a little better. My husband occasionally, he's not the world's greatest photographer, because he'll take like three pictures, and then be like, I did it, it's done. And you're like, I'm on with like 200 pictures. <laughs> so, and that is the process. I will dress up in the clothes, sometimes I put on wigs, just because I don't always want to have to make my hair just right for it. Um, sometimes there's hair, sometimes there's a mouth. Generally, it never goes above the mouth. Um, so usually, but I do take about 200 pictures because there's really, and if I were to pull up like a contact sheet or, or show you, you'll see how the subtlest difference or what you're saying in the piece. Like if she's cutting the cake versus if she's serving the cake versus if she's making the cake, they say different things. And so you'll usually find that one or two kind of just, they're like, that's the piece, that's, but there's a lot of difference in just the subtle composition of, like, you know, I was looking at one the other day and I was like, you know, this would be good, but the body is just too boring and static, right? You want that, like, shift or you want that. So, so it usually um, revolves around that. I do use photography lights, so I highly recommend that if any of you are doing, you can buy inexpensive photography lights, the little white umbrella diffusers, but it makes a big difference when you're doing a photo shoot, especially if it's indoors. Um, you get much better light, and so I highly recommend that. Also, when I'm shooting these, the camera is about this high off the floor, so that it's actually not what you would expect, but I don't want the distortion. I have to be really careful that I don't get weird distorted mm -hmm. angles. Um, so the process is usually that I sort of my sketchbook is not, this is an unusually organized sketchbook page for me. People always think sketchbooks, like, you know, they sort of assume there are certain things. My sketchbooks are a lot of writing in addition to drawing, and most of my drawings aren't much bigger than this. It's more kind of, I'm translating something I'm seeing in my head, and I'm putting down just enough, not that I'm really fleshing it out, that I'm just like making a note of the idea in my because it's not like when I go into the photo shoot, I know exactly, oh, I'm going to want this arm here and this because it's just there's too many variables. You don't know until you get in it and then you're like, oh, I can't even see the book that's on the counter because of the angle. I need to move this. I need to change this. So you can't really get that precise, but it's more what is a theme or an idea or a setting or something that I want to play with. And so I just sort of brainstorm those. So that's in general kind of... You know, my sketchbook is a generally, I mean, there's other things that are just packed, but it's just playing. Or I may work on, um, so if I was working on desserts, I might just do variations on a theme that I'm playing with, like what is the container, you know, what is the pattern that I'm using, what is the repetition. But they're not always, you know, you can see there's lots of writing, because if I'm planning out things for a show or for a series, I'm just sort of playing with ideas and sort of thinking through them in my head before I go to make the cake or before I figure out what else do I need to convey this thing that I'm doing. But my sketchbook is not, people always think of like a preliminary sketch as this like, <laughs> you must do this preliminary sketch. It, it, that's just not how it works for me. It's, it's sort of this combination of practices and I'm a big believer in using technology. so. It's usually a photo shoot, you know, it's usually ideas. If I'm doing a photo shoot, I probably won't do more than two or three scenes at a time because honestly, it's really exhausting to be like, to have to think about <laughs> when you can't see the picture that's being taken and you're the model in it, but you're also having to direct it and imagine, it's really complicated in your mind to try to think of how that's translating because if you get up every second to like, uh, what did that shot look like? Then you've got to try to get back into the position. And so, so it's a lot of work for me mentally when I'm doing the photo shoots. Going through the photo shoots, picking out the favorites, I usually tag them with colors when I'm going through the photo shoot and then I sort them by tag and then I again go through all the tagged ones. I use Photoshop on my computer to crop it. Um, and I highly recommend this. I think a lot of people um, 
And this is something that a lot of my students have found really helpful as well, is you can get Photoshop elements. It's not like regular Photoshop that you have to pay huge amounts every month for. It's a one-time download, but you can do so much with it that I doubt it would take a long time for you to pass up the capabilities where you would need regular Photoshop from Photoshop Elements. But you can easily crop images, you can brighten up things, you can, if I want to take the head off of this body and put it onto this body, I can do that. Like, I can do a lot with, with different tools to play with that, but I often recommend that because, um, again, being able to play with different elements or I had a student in one of my classes and she was like, I took this picture, you know, I really love what's going on here, but there was, there's this, this telephone pole that I really love in this other image. And so we just took that telephone pole and moved it into the other image because if she had been one foot further back, it would have been there, but compositionally it made the painting so much stronger. So just that ability to go in and in two minutes move it into the image so that she then had it ready in her reference made paintings so I'm a big believer in using technology, um, even just using your phone. I often have my students take pictures, turn them to black and white. Um, it's, I often teach them to, uh, like the Grisai technique, if any of you know what Grisai is, yes or no, where you paint the whole painting first in value. So it's just in black and white, and then you add all the color through glaze layers, and it's tr traditionally done in oils, but you can do it just as well in acrylics. But I often will have students, another helpful tool in Photoshop is there's an eyedropper tool. And so I'll be like, take your image in, and when you're trying to see why your colors aren't working, go and sample it in the image. And nine times out of ten, you're going to be way off, right? You're not making it dark enough, it's not saturated enough. And so it lets you sort of check and see, oh, am I on track? Am I not on track? Or wow, I didn't know that there was purple in that white. I didn't know there was a pink base to that white because it will show you on the chart how white to black it is and what the base color is. So there's a lot of really helpful tools. Or I'll say, take a picture of your painting, turn it to black and white, and turn your reference to black and white and look at those and see where it's off. And then it's like, oh yeah, I'm totally like losing X value and it's weakening the whole piece or my colors are off. So there's a lot of great tools in technology. I know sometimes people feel like, I don't know how to do that, I don't know where to start, but there's some really easy things that can make a big difference in how successful your work is feeling. So I take the photos, I have the idea, I take the photos, sort through the photos, Decide on the crop. Typically, this whole series is 30 by 40. Occasionally, I've done bigger ones. The biggest one was 5 feet by 7 feet. Um, and I will say, painting large is not necessarily harder than painting small. In fact, painting small is harder than painting big. So, painting an 8 by 10 is more challenging than painting a 30 by 40. And it is also less time efficient. So, for me, Painting a 24 by 36 will probably take me the same amount of time as painting a 30 by 40. So you can find, because the smaller you go, the like tighter you get, right? The fussier your little brush, like every millimeter counts and can totally throw it off. Like if you're doing a portrait and the head is this big, you have to nail every half a millimeter or it doesn't look like the person at all. If you're painting this scale, a millimeter is not going to make or break the painting. So for me, it's much looser, it's much freer, it's less tight, um, and I just like the size. Like there's, and there are certain things that if you were to scale these paintings down to eight by 10, it just doesn't convey the same thing as when you have 40 of these lined up that are 30 by 40, right? It says something very different. So the way that scale goes into your work. Um, in terms of starting a piece, People always have all different feelings on this, and I'm the first person to tell you, I do not have a lot of hard and fast rules about what is right or what is wrong in art. Like, you can use whatever tools make it work for you, and whatever makes you enjoy the work, whatever helps you to be successful at the work. It's, there's not like, 
all artists must freehand draw everything. Since for old masters, they used all sorts of reflection techniques. They used projection techniques. They used they had people in their studios who did half of the work for them. Like there's, you know, there's there's all these sorts of rules that we sometimes set up for ourselves around the work. There, so some people may choose to freehand work or use a grid method. That's probably the first method people use to try to ensure they don't have a lot of distortion in their work is to grid the image. Like if you want to do that, then I'm like, take it, slip it in a clear sheet protector, draw grid lines on the sheet protector so you don't, you can actually pull it out and you haven't put big sharpie lines over important pieces of your thing. Grid your canvas, although make sure you're doing it to the same ratio, right? Too often people will be like, they have that square image and the rectangle canvas and they, you know, like, don't do that to your brain. Like, crop the image to the right ratio so your brain's not having to do all this work of trying to, like, figure out what it needs to eliminate. And again, like, block off sections. Go a section at a time if you're doing it that way. Other people use a carbon transfer one of two ways. Like, literally, you buy sheets of carbon, you print out your image the same size as your surface, you put down the carbon paper, you put down your image and you trace and it will leave the carbon lines and then you pull it off and your lines are all there and you can focus on your painting. Because I think sometimes it's easy to get frustrated a lot of times people will say, well I love painting but I'm bad at drawing. Well then their paintings struggle because they struggle with perspective, they struggle with distortions, they struggle with any of these things. So make it so that you can be successful and enjoy the parts you want. Most artists use some form of transfer, projection, whatever. Um, because that's what works for their process. You can also, you can use a carbon transfer with carbon paper. If you don't even have carbon paper, you literally just take a pencil, scribble the back of your image, and then push on it, and it will transfer the graphite onto your piece. Um, you can use projection, digital projector, or old school overhead projectors. I am a lover of the old school overhead projector. I don't find that digital projectors give me the resolution I want, so I have never used those, but I was about 10 paintings into my domestic series and my husband was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I was like, yeah, maybe there is. And I was just freehanding and gritting them. And for me, it takes the prep time, if I use projection, from three, three and a half hours of drawing to about 30 minutes. So especially from a commercial sense, it's a lot, that's another third of a painting I could do that's not being spent now on, and I didn't love that part. So I was like, why am I making this part harder for myself instead of the part that I really enjoy, which is the painting part. So I fully support all methods that you want to use to develop images. Um, to create what you want for your piece. I paint in acrylics. They're my favorite medium. I like them because they're relatively safe. Um, they dry quickly. You can play with them. You can make mistakes. It's never the end of the world. You can't ruin it. You just paint over it. Um, I always had children around, so I have three sons, 21, 16, and 14. So my house was very busy, and I didn't want a lot of toxic things. Um, so if I ever do, rarely, occasionally paint in oils, I still underpaint fully in acrylics and just use oils to finish off the top so I can get the, the effects I want. I don't set up my palette in any super crazy way. I don't have some magic method. I use all different lines of paint. Some people are very like strict on like, you only use true primaries and you mix everything off of these and I am not a believer in that. In fact, there are lines of paint, for example, that navy blue that's in that chair is this certain line of paint. And in fact, I mean, it's not full strength here, but the paint is such a rich blue that it will be darker than a black, but it's still a blue. Right? Like you'll see it next to other blacks and you'll be like, wait, how is blue darker than black? But it's just primary mixing is getting me to that. Because it just has to do with the pigments that are in that paint. 
So I use all different lines of acrylic and vinyl paints. I love flashé. I like the polycolor, uh, the Mimieri line. Um, I use Amsterdam ones and different, different brands make different colors that act very differently. And so a lot of times people say, well, I have buff titanium. And I'll be like, but buff titanium in this line is totally different than buff titanium in this line. And it will yield very different colors, especially when you're mixing them. So just being aware of that and sort of learning and finding. I often recommend to people when they start painting, sometimes people are like, no, only give people primary colors to make them mix. And again, true primaries, which we know are really cyan, magenta, and primary blue, like the colors that are on the top of your box of cereal or that your printer ink comes out of, because too many times people think primary colors are like red, yellow, and blue, like cadmium red or yellow and ultramarine blue. And if you try to mix all the colors from that, you will never make good colors because they will all turn out yucky because they're not true primaries. So you'll wind up with really gross looking purples and really dirty oranges and things because you're not using the right color to get there. But what I recommend to people is usually buy a big tube of white like Amsterdam makes a set of like 92 sampler colors. And I'm like, have your few basics, but get this 92 sampler set and see what you love, see what you gravitate to. And I mix a lot of paint. Like people think, oh, if you have hundreds of tubes of paint, you know, you're just using it out of the tube. I'm rarely using anything straight out of the tube. But having 90 starting points gives me a lot of shortcuts and allows me to have a lot of subtle variation within my pieces. And you'll notice that I use a lot of discrete paint, right? The paint tends to not blend. It tends to be much more graphic or illustrative in the application of the paint. But again, like there's, and you know, for any one of these, there's probably three to five layers of paint over any given area. So first it's sort of blocking in, I do always start from a white canvas in this series. Other people will be like, no, I can always tell you, like, never start from a white canvas. I'm always like, no. I have other series, like my desserts, I always start with a gray canvas. And there's a reason for that, which is they're on these glossy white surfaces. And I can build up so many more levels of white off of a gray value ground, right? Because one coat of white over gray is white two coats of white over gray, seven coats of white over gray is like super white, right? But I can get a much broader range within my whites by doing that. However, these pieces, you'll notice especially with the skin, they're sort of like an illuminated or a lightness to the skin that if I have an undercoat, it just dirties that, right? Like I'm trying to get past that dirtiness and I don't like that. I like the crispness and the sharpness and the control of the color. And if I put a base coat down on everything, I'm gonna have to fight that out of the piece. I want really pure and really true colors. So I'm going off of a white canvas. Of course, that means I have to be sure I cover all the surfaces really well and I don't have those little white, little white fleckies showing through, right, from the canvas texture or whatever we're doing. So that's kind of um, my approach to these. But again, sometimes we, we get told these rules, like you shouldn't or you should do this, but I, you know, I would always argue with people on their rules. I like to use gray palettes. I just use peelable palettes, so when my paint dries, it peels right off. I really like gray palettes over white palettes because I can see the lighter values so much better, especially if you're using a really uh, wide range of whites or light colors. White on white is really hard to see those subtle differences, but on the gray, it's much easier to see. So um, I'm not a, I'm not a brush snob. I actually really like to use cheap brushes. Um, I use a lot of flat brushes. I'm pretty hard on my brushes in terms of just um, I don't like bristle brushes. I don't like sable brushes. I like synthetic brushes, just like the tension of the bristles, to get the kind of line quality that I want. Um, so I think knowing what effects you want in your painting help you to really decide what materials and tools are best for you. So I don't use a lot of mediums in my work. I usually use a satin varnish when I'm done. 
I do use um, glaze medium for doing shadows, for doing subtle colors. Um, glazing in acrylics, I think, is it's a much more natural part of oil painting, but people don't often use it enough in. Um, but I really think it can make an incredible difference in work. For example, when I try to tell people the power of glaze, it's like if you, uh, so a place I would use it is say on this skirt where you're going to have these white polka dots, but there's shadows within the folds, right? But I can just mix a little bit of gray, it makes a transparent gray, right? So I can lay that over the whole thing and it's not, I'm not going to lose it. If you do this pattern on a tablecloth, it's not so harsh and stark that you're painting these totally different opaque colors where the shadow is cast. But instead there's just this sheer transparent color or darkness that goes over that area. Or things like, imagine a really light orange pumpkin, right? And the light is shining on it and you get those parts that it's like, it's, it's almost white, but it's still orange. Well, the minute you mix orange in with your white paint, it is no longer orange, it is peach, right? So the way to get that light orange is to paint white, mix your orange in with the glaze so it's super transparent, and then lay it over the white. And again, so many times people are fighting with value in a piece, and I'm like, paint it white, and then come back with your lightest, sheerest layers of color. And the glaze really helps to add a lot of dimension, um, a lot of subtlety, a lot of complexity when you're when you're working on pieces like if I'm painting glass or I'm painting fruits or I'm painting birds or something like that. This is what I will really use to get those nice complexities because you can lay a sheer layer of this blending into a sheer layer of this or you can have red and blue and purple all in these different concentrations and elements. So, um, But that's the primary medium that I use when I'm painting. I paint on canvas, I paint on wood panel, I sometimes do poured resin um, finishes, but that tends to be my favorite grounds and surfaces that I like to paint. Um, other questions that people have, hopefully this is being helpful in the, in the process. Like, it's, well, it's interesting to watch people paint, I think I probably give you more interesting things than what I have to say than, than just watching me paint forever and ever. Um, so, um, I can show you, so I typically just keep the image on my computer. This is the image that is the base image for this. It doesn't mean I'll necessarily interpret it just like this, right? I'll often change up the colors or the patterns, but mostly what I just want when I'm doing um, a photo shoot is to have the basic elements there. I want to see where shadows are going to fall. I want to see how the figure is going to interact with it. Other things I can move or change or Photoshop, but the truth is, the closer you have it to what you really want, generally the better it's going to turn out, right? The less you're making up, the more it's going to feel consistent or the less distortion that you're going to have in it that's unintentional. So, um, what I thought I would do is Maybe show you how I say lay down paint. Um, I'll do some of the skin because I think that's something a lot of people feel a lot of hesitation about or sort of like I've kind of learned what recipe works for me for my pasty white skin <laughs> over the years um, to, to achieve the look that I want and also the consistency that I want across the series. Now the base for me when I'm doing skin is a buff titanium. If I use a white, it tends to get way too pasty, right? Like way too, you just can't get the strength of, I mean, you can use a mixing white, but this line, the Dela Rowney System 3, is my very favorite buff titanium. I find other ones like the Liquitex pulls a little bit warmer, a little bit, and you'll notice it as you're, like if I were to interchange, I can see the difference as I'm mixing all the tones along the way. So kind of work until you find what works for you, but know that they're very different from, from line to line. So I use raw sienna, and they changed some of the tubes now. Usually I don't squeeze through the holes, I unscrew them. 
and squeeze stuff out, and it just had stuff in a box from teaching some teenagers. So I'm using what I have. Um, wet, washy, not super thick. I could again do that on purpose. I think the skin stays a lot more luminous because it pulls more of the white from underneath the canvas. So I just work to lay down. I love flatter angle brushes. But first it's just sort of defining the values. Now the pieces, I talked about the discrete use of paint. Um, the pieces actually have a lot of relationship to periodical illustrations, like mid-century periodical illustrations of like the 1950s and 60s, like McCall's magazine, or there would be artists like Kobe Whitmore, and it's really interesting because I didn't even know about these artists, well, illustrators, when I first began my series. And, but what I really liked is they're really, there's some really good books of their work they're really interesting compositions because they were usually doing an illustration for a magazine layout that was going to have a bunch of text around them. They were often very relational or focused on women, and they were done in these bold colors and interesting compositions. And, um, but they painted them in acrylic. They would go and do a photo shoot. Like, as I read more about their processes, I was like, oh, this is totally related to my work. So the process that they would use was Hire a model, bring in the furniture, bring in the lights, take a picture, do a quick acrylic painting. They would actually um, process the photo in different ways. Like so one that was super contrasted because they were illustrators. So they're like, I need to have four or five values in this piece. So they would would process the photo to be in different forms, which is much what any of us could do today on our computers. Same thing, or like taking that picture with your phone and turning it black and white. How does that help inform the pieces? So, um, so then I was like, oh, these people are totally my people because we use a very similar um, approach. So I'm just sort of basically looking at where things are. And I don't really worry. I don't necessarily use fixative because I tend to sort of absorb the, the pencil into the first layer a bit and I kind of often, like it kind of grays out the first layer a little bit, but if you use a lot of fixative it makes the lines really like immovable and it, so I don't necessarily like that. However, if I was doing a really intricate pattern I might spray it with fixative after I draw it, just so that I don't lose my lines. I carefully, carefully did. So my next value is probably just going to be more of a straight buff titanium. I'm just going to start to build up. And you'll see there are very subtle differences, but what I'm wanting to do is to create that, like to create a subtle change in the figure. Sorry, it takes a long time to paint my areas, but I'm just not a lover of small paintings, and it's a better thing for me to see it. So feel free to ask me questions too if you have things you want to know. As I'm going on, you can just shout. Is that personally a dry area? Um, just about. Okay. So it's nice because it's very. You know, I always thought the cheap thrills part of the painting is those first coats, like, kind of map out the whole thing, and you're like, oh, look, it's like the first 80% of the painting gets done, and, and the first, you know, if you were to divide the amount of time it takes to do a painting in half, you would get about 80% of the way in the first half, and then the second half is all the way. The little details, and that part is far less rewarding. So, so next I'm going to sort of take buff titanium. I put a little bit of the um, the raw sienna, a little bit of purple, a little bit of yellow, 
And it's like tiny touches. Like we're not talking major, major amounts because we're trying to just achieve these, these changes. But I don't stress out too much because the first layer is sort of defining relationships and sort of determining what's going where. And again, those relationships, is this too dark? Is this too light? Right? What, how do those play together? And with acrylics, for those of you who painted acrylics, you know that one, acrylics lose 70% of their body as they dry because they're water-based. And two, they always dry darker than they are when they're wet. And so, um, especially with acrylics, you're constantly fighting that what is the color I'm laying down in relation to the color it's going to be when, I, um, when it actually dries. So you're not really interested in blending the layer? I'm not, because it, depending on what you're doing, I mean, there's times when, yes, I'm doing like wet into wet paint, and I'm really trying to get that smooth feeling. But for these pieces, I want a more illustrative and I don't mix gobs and gobs of paint. Like some people will squeeze out enormous amounts of paint, but I would rather, especially because it's acrylic, keep putting out fresh, keep mixing, because versus mixing one gigantic pile, because it actually adds more depth to the piece. If every time I put down a layer, it's slightly different from the layer that was under it, than if I just mixed up three vats of color and it was like one, two, three, right? So there's a lot of subtlety that comes into the pieces through that. So again, I like it pretty wet. This is pretty washy paint. Um, and the skin is often only two or three layers. Again, because I like to maintain more of the luminosity. And sometimes I like it just a little bit painterly, even within the discreteness of you know, what I paint. And because it is washy paint, if I want to sort of make more of a transition or a blend, you can sort of play with that in a really gentle way. You know, I think a big thing we tend to do is not push value changes enough, right? It's easy for us to kind of go safe in pieces and make them a little too flat. So um, when I get to the shadow pieces, I usually use a lot more purple. Sometimes I use periwinkle blue. Sometimes I'll actually do strips or elements in it that are really <coughs> blue or purple. Um, but this for me tends to achieve a really consistent set of colors that I'm happy with in terms of creating figure. A lot of people, I think, tend to not use enough water and get frustrated. One, the water helps you to avoid those little white, whitey flecks. Although some of that happens because the paint is shrinking as it's drying. And so you're like, I know I painted over that, but it like just shrinks in and pulls out of those little holes. But, especially when you're trying to like refine something, you can get such a nicer edge when there's a lot of water in the paint than when it's a really thick paint and you're trying to get it. So for me, if I want that really nice clean edge, a washy layer actually gets me that edge better than a thick layer. So, I just, and I just kind of go through the progression of values, sort of building up. And sometimes if I get one pile a little bit too dark, I just move it to the side and save it for when I'm getting to section. And again, I'm just going to keep moving along.
I also really encourage people to exhibit work. You know, it can often make people feel sort of vulnerable or, I don't know, like, but I think exhibiting your work is a way of giving back to the community. Like, we all appreciate the inspiration that comes to us from seeing uh, works of art. And so I think we sort of return that favor by by showing our own work, even if it feels um, times like we're just learning or we're just trying. Um, I do think having shows or having purposes that you're creating for can really help to propel you to better work and also encourage you to try things or to put in effort that you might not if you're thinking, oh, this doesn't matter, I'm just doing this for this. So there's always good shows around, museum shows, um, organizations, you know, different things, but I really think it's a great um, way to help connect you in our community and also to help develop your work. Um, I love that New England has a lot of regional museums, and I think those provide really great opportunities for work um, to be exhibited to develop museum credentials, to, to expand what you're doing. Um, also, I encourage people to think a lot about how they're presenting work. Sometimes we just default to the most um, traditional it's going to be matted and framed. And instead of you know, one of my students, I was teaching private lessons to in the pandemic, and he was really interested in really traditional fine rendering. But I was like, you know, that's interesting, but how is it going to look different than anything anyone else does? And so we started talking about what subject matter he was doing and the toned paper, and then he started toning his own paper with paints and working mostly in white and on these and then he ended up doing some pieces and, and he was like, I really like this piece and I was like, well, how else could you exhibit it? Like it was like these shells that his mother had collected and I was like, well, how could you exhibit them to be more like specimens in a museum? And so he was like, I have this old like thing that was my grandfather's it has all these metal trays. So he started using the metal trays to mount the pictures on to then hang in the show in lieu of a really traditional frame. Like if you had just framed it, you'd be like, eh, show. Like, but this gave it so much more context and so much more interest. So I'm a really big believer in sometimes saying, okay, what can we do to make this piece of work memorable or interesting? Or how can we give it this different context? Um, and so sometimes thinking about how you present the work um, can be a really good way to do that. And sometimes saying, what's, an, what's a, it may be a really traditional subject, but how can I bring it to someone in a slightly different manner? So as you can see, I'm just building up almost paint by number the value changes here that will then become much more subtle but it helps me to really map out where things are in the piece. But you can see it's light, it's watchy, it's sometimes I'm getting stuff up. Okay, so what other questions or if you want to share things that you're struggling with in your own processes or projects or places you get stuck, please feel free to ask those questions because I really love to help people be successful in their work or brainstorm ways to make their work more successful or meaningful to them. Do you enjoy painting full portraits? Um, not as much. It's not the part that I love. Like some people, the joy of capturing likeness is like the thrill for them. Um, I have a son who's like, I really want to paint portraits. 
I mean, I will do portraits on occasion, but again, it's just not the thing that I really am a lover of color. So one thing you'll notice across all my series is I use a lot of very high color um, and a lot of discrete color. But um, so portraits are okay to me. I don't love, especially commission portraits, I find commission work is a very I don't like to do more than 20%, 25% of my workload to be commissions, mostly because for me it's a very constrained space. Trying to nail that thing between the client's mind and your mind, and you just feel like, oh, are they gonna like that? Do they want this? Like, or you know, I I generally won't take portraits or commissions that are outside of the realm of what I normally paint, but I don't like that constraint it just it's you're not really getting up and are like I can't wait to paint this today you're getting up and are like I need to finish this today <laughs> that being said I have had a lot of commissions in the last few years and I can't seem to get a wave like just when I finish then someone will especially clients that I've had for a long time will be like could you do this and I'm really bad at saying no and so then I wind up buried back under a pile of like, um, although I've come to a point where I won't have actively more than four commissions at a time because I find if I do one, I can't tell you exactly when I'm going to finish because I can't spec out how long it's going to take me to get through that many paintings. I won't paint on a painting when I'm not feeling it because the last thing you want me to do is to be like, <laughs> you know, like. I must paint this. It will just look terrible. And I tell clients that you don't want me to paint on your piece when I'm not feeling it for your piece because it just won't turn out well. Um, but I've learned that I'll keep like, like right now I have a client that I have three more commissions that are waiting and they're sort of in the like in the queue, but they're not in the active mode yet. And once I finish ones in the active mode, then I can move something over from the queue. But it also gives me breathing room in between that because if I'm like, I have seven commissions to do, then I feel like I can't stop and do anything I want to do because it's like hanging over you, like I need to finish these. And so I am trying to develop a healthy relationship with how I, um, how I limit commission work because I do think you need to have room for, some people love doing commissions, I like, creating things of meaning for people, but commissions are complicated spaces. Other things people often ask about is the pricing of work, which I think everyone needs to think about, but that's always a really difficult thing as well. You can price based on time, you can price based on uh, size. I usually do it based on square inch generally. That being said, I've told you that small pieces are harder so sometimes there's a premium on smaller pieces because they take more time for um, And I also tell people that often when people are starting, they price too low because then, first of all, there's two things that are wrong with that. One, if you are, I'll be happy because I'm just doing this for fun. Well then, the artist who's trying to make a living, everyone's like, why is your painting $500 and their painting is $20, you know? So, you don't do that because you'll make other people mad. And then the other problem people have is they, you know, start painting and they don't expect, like, they're like, I'm just doing this for fun. This is just a great hobby. Well then, suddenly, they find themselves more successful than they expected. And a gallery comes to them and says, hey, can I sell your work? And now, instead of getting the full amount, you're getting half because they're taking your commission. And so you also need to think about, as you're pricing your work, um, it's uncomfortable if you suddenly have to raise your prices 50% because now a gallery is getting a cut of that. Um, and it's, so, and I think another great way to do it, because people always feel awkward about pricing, Especially when it's like friends, like someone you know in a neighbor's like, oh, I love that piece, can I buy it? And then you're like, oh, what do I say? I how I did. So I usually tell people, you make up a little spreadsheet on the computer. If someone asks you, you just say, I'll send you the pricing sheet, right? So it's the best way because I find so many of us 
struggle with those awkward conversations of valuing our work. And it's especially often a problem for women undervaluing their work. Um, and so being able to do that in a non-emotional or non-interactive space, but sitting down and writing your prices, and then just, this is it. You either want it or you don't want it, but you don't have to be in that face-to-face -face negotiation part that can be really awkward. Now, the other thing you can also do is you can always give a discount. You can, because here's the other problem, right? People will have their neighbor who wants to buy this painting and you love them, and so you give it to them for 250. Well, then the neighbor's friend sees your piece and wants one, but they're gonna expect to get it for 250, right? So this is the problem. So it's not, so you can always have your rack rate price and then you can have your special friend discount if you want, but it also then prevents you from being stuck in one of those awkward situations where suddenly everyone now thinks they can have one of your paintings for $200, and that's not a sustainable practice. The other thing I recommend is um, sort of doing price increases annually, which asks me if I'm always good about doing this myself, and I will tell you no, but then it comes back to bite you because you have to raise your prices in bigger terms. So it's just like every year, January 1st, you go into the spreadsheet and you know people are like, how much? You know, well, if you think inflation is 3%, but every year you're getting better as an artist. So at least like 5% is probably a reasonable jump. You can certainly go more than that, but I wouldn't consider going less than that. Like you should value your work and the time and effort that you put in. So um, that's a little bit of my thoughts on prices. So what other things um, are sort of areas you're looking to develop or improve in your personal practice or you're trying to get better at or learn more about and I'm happy to talk to this. Well, I found several of your comments very helpful. One is that um, you don't feel that artists need to paint in just one style. Uh, the idea that you don't, one does not have to mix gobs of paint and on a palette that has a preordained structure and always needs to be the same. Um, painting wet uh, is helpful. I think that also helps to pre prevent these ridges mm -hmm. in the painting. Mm -hmm. That you can't get off very well, right? People always, I had a friend of mine, she lives in Poland, and I, I teach a virtual class too. And um, she's in my virtual class, and because she started painting with me when they lived here over there in Poland, and she was like, how do I get this ridge off of my canvas? And I was like, well, <laughs> she's like, you mean I can't? And I was like, I really know. You can try to sand it, but it doesn't really work. The best suggestion is just build up more paint around it and try to minimize it, right? But but yes, that's that's a very real a very real thing. Sorry, I wasn't trying to derail your no, but your insights. You said three or four other things um, that I have found quite helpful um, that I need to think about. I That's okay, it's, it's not expected to be <laughs> profound, right? I do think, I, I really think too, I journal a lot, I believe in writing a lot, I believe in thinking a lot about what matters to you, and then how do you say that with pictures. It doesn't have to be some crazy abstraction. It can be if that's what you want, but it's just how can this be a metaphor for something that means something. In fact, I was always grateful that I have degrees in other things because sometimes I'm like, if you only study art, then what else do you have that you talk about? Like, like I have these other things that I love and I'm deeply passionate about, these whole like fields of interest and knowledge that inform my work. So sometimes I'm like, if you want to be a successful artist, sometimes it's not studying as much art as it is studying other things that you really want to talk about or really want to do things with. 
And then finding ways to visually like connect those, those elements. So I encourage a lot of writing, a lot of thinking, and just brainstorm. How can I say this thing? What can I use to convey this, this concept? Um, what around me sort of says that? And um, so if you can see she's starting to come together a little bit here for a quick Stretch your own canvases. I do not. It is never worth my time to do that. The only time I will do that is if I have to do some really wonky size for like a commission project. And sometimes you can get the kits because it's actually hard to get like a seven foot canvas delivered. <laughs> um, but no, I usually, Dick Black, Michaels, they're good by me. I do, like this canvas was from Michaels. And I will say that Michael's tends to be rougher than Dick Blick, and I find that the roughness of the canvas, I don't paint on linen, I paint on canvas, slows me down when I'm painting. So if I actually am good and stop and put an extra layer of gesso on, it will go faster. My brush will slide much more. A lot of times that, you know, they just spray on a cheap coat of, of gesso, and it's not a lot. And it makes it a little bit trickier to get, like, it's so thirsty and so rough that the paint takes to it very roughly. And again, those little white bits, mm -hmm. that's much more likely to happen. So just quickly throwing down a second coat of gesso, you can feel the difference between, like, the front and the sides. I didn't do it on, I don't care if you touch my canvas after. But um, it makes a difference, like this one. I think it's a Dick Blick one. You can feel like a little bit of a texture difference. Um, I'm a, I kind of like the Michael ones because they're heavier. And every four times a year, they like repeat the same sale pattern. And it's like sometimes it's buy one, get two free. So you hold out for those or the 70% off, which is when I buy my big canvases. And then like a 48 by 60 canvas is only like $30. And you're like, who cares, right? And I always tell people it's cheaper than golf. So, like, it doesn't matter. It's cheaper than golf. Like, even if you, and I think too often we're, we're so concerned about, like, wasting the supplies or ruining it that we're very hesitant. And I remember in my early days of painting, when I very first sold, like, a piece or two, and I was like, okay, I can now buy 60 canvases. Like, with what I just sold one painting for. So then I just became much looser, like, who cares? It was just a canvas. Like it was three dollars. Like it's cheaper than going. Like, you take the amount of time you spent on the canvas. It's cheaper than going to the movies. Like it's cheaper than buying a coffee. Like it's cheaper than like like. And yeah, we're like, oh, I'm gonna ruin it. I you know like. So, and I have one student who's just she's always like, I've got to get past my depression era mentality. She'll literally put out like a dot of paint, and we're like, come on, come on, like half a teaspoon, you can do it. <laughs> But in the end, you create much better work when you're not so worried about, oh, I'm going to ruin it, I'm going to waste it. Like, paint over it. Give it to someone else. Give it to a child. Like, like repurpose it into something else. Um, and I also had this great advice that a friend of mine gave me early on, which was always be working on something. I don't always do this, but I do it sometimes. And when I do, it turns out well who said, always be working on something epic, like something museum worthy. Like stretch yourself to make something that's not just what you're traditionally doing. And I remember taking that to heart and I got like a big canvas and it ended up being like the first museum show I put a piece in and it ended up winning an award. And then they ended up asking me to do a solo exhibit. And like it turned into all of these different things but it was just taking that chance to work on a scale that I had never worked in before. And so again, it's, is there a new medium? Is there a new method of presentation? Is there a scale that you need to work on? Maybe it's lots of tiny pieces that accumulate to be something, because that feels a lot less scary, right? You can make 60 of them and curate down to your favorite 30, you know, or something epically large. 
Um, there's so many different directions that you can go, but sort of thinking, how can I push and propel my work to go in different directions? So I really thought that was wonderful advice, and it has served me well. And again, it's sort of balancing um, painting for the joy of painting, and now as it has become my career and my job painting for, as a job. Um, so I do recommend that to people. And also like a series, whether or not, um, I think it's easy for us to sort of just kind of one off, one off, one off. But really, even if we want to explore different areas, like try to design a series. Like um, I remember doing some shows for Arts Worcester years ago, and I had written to do a, a show. I do a series of bookshelves, and they're all these. They're mixed media pieces that use. So I paint the book, the spines of the books, and then I embellish them with these pieces of cut up glassine. So I paint all different patterns and colors on the glassine and cut it up and put it in so it creates these really, it's my favorite series to work in from the point of it's just relaxing and fun and it just feels like fun. There's no right and there's no wrong. Everyone turned out different. But like just doing this series that was going to be in a show, but I was like, there's just so many variations you can do with a bookshelf, right? Like, so I had ones that were four feet. I had ones that were 25 little six inch ones with all different colored backgrounds. I had ones where the books were stacked. I had ones where the books were leaning. I had things that were offset shelves. I had ones where I limited the color palette. I had ones that had resin and wood, right? Like how can you even just take one thing but repeat variations and different things on that? And so often we sort of just get stuck in, well, I've done my one thing, or sometimes we're like, you know, there's there's constant choices that you have to make when you're painting. Am I going to do it this way? Am I going to do it this way? And I'm always like, just do a second one, but you do it this way. Like sometimes you just have to tell your brain, stop being paralyzed by the decision-making process, and just say, I'm going to I'm gonna paint this one and go this direction. I'm going to take the same image and go this direction. And let yourself do those sort of explorations and variations. And it also keeps you from getting paralyzed and stuck. I also tell people to take a picture when you sit down to start working on the painting, and take a picture when you finish working on the painting, so that you're always seeing the progress you made. Because too often we kind of think, oh, we get disappointed. And then we, if you look back, you go, wow, well, that actually improved a lot over the last two hours. Um, I tend to find, for me, two to three hour painting blocks, I generally won't go over four hours, it's just not productive for me. I need to take a break, get a fresh palette, like by the end of three hours I'm just, it's getting muddy, I'm losing focus. Um, so learn what time works for you and don't expect more than that. Like learn to work within those constraints of I'll do a three hour session and then I go do this or, or whatever. I also find like I like to listen to audiobooks. I have to be careful because after a while I'll start to tune out the audiobook. I'll put on movies. I almost always listen to music. I cannot work in a silent studio. Like, it kills me. Like, it makes me start just getting tired. Or if I have music that's too high energy, again, it makes me tired. If I have music that's too slow, I'm like, <laughs> Some people can paint classical music. I cannot paint classical music. I'm like, I love it, but not when I paint it, because it will just slow me down too much. So there's a very definite speed that I have, or style that I like, um, when I'm in the studio. Because I've learned what helps me do the work the best. Um, so I'll try to quickly here, in my five minutes, give you sort of a view of, I'll start laying down a little bit of a second coat, so you can see the sort of difference, how it just instantly Kind of becomes more refined, more opaque. Um, now, is your paint any thicker? Or is it the same? Not much. Not much. A little bit. I mean, you can see it's. Okay. It's pretty. It's pretty thin. It's pretty wet. But again, I like that because it avoids that sense of like a heavy, pasty. 
sort of loftiness. Instead, it feels smooth and it feels um, fluid and again retains a lot of that lightness from underneath of the canvas. That I'm sorry, you could do that by painting your canvas white, but the paint sticks differently to white paint than it does to gesso, right? And sometimes it winds up patchy when you do that. So, yeah, for all your teachers who've ever said, get the white out, I'm telling them no. <laughs> Be as rebellious as you want in your work. Like, no one's going to, like, the art police are coming after you. They've never come for me in all my years. Um, Do you want to get some sort of... Do you always use such a tiny brush? Um, I usually do paint with pretty small brushes. I mean, the biggest I ever probably use is this. Yeah. Um, the smallest I ever use is probably this. I tend to, I mean, that's not that small. I tend to, I tend to use flats, but I tend to use small to mid-size flats. Um, so, but this is why I said I'm hard on brushes, because, you know, it's... And it's a little weird, like, I'm crossing my body a lot, so I'm losing a little bit of when they're in the same plane and you're looking at the color next, I guess I can hold it in It's weird enough for me to paint while standing sideways, standing up. <laughs> so. so do you usually have your piece flat down on the table? Or I do. I have a great desk that I love from Ikea that you can raise and lower the height. And I actually keep it pretty low. Um, I keep my laptop on like an elevated stand so it gives me more workspace. And I come, um, yeah, so I tend to paint flat. I have a good desk chair too. I did buy myself that in the pandemic. And um, and my biggest suggestion is just paint a lot. Do master studies, look at other work you like, use that as a way to sort of explore like good art class at the St. Louis Art Museum, as I like to draw. And we show up the first day, and I have my sketchbook and my pencils, like they told me to bring. And the teacher, we follow her, and she takes us to the ancient art gallery, which was like Greek and Roman sculptures. Now remember, this is like mixed 11, 12 year olds. And she sits us down in front of these like nude Aphrodite <laughs> and Adonis, and is like, this is what we're going to draw today. And we're all like, I'm thinking like, I can draw a flower and draw a parrot. Like, I don't even have these parts, so I don't even know what I should be doing. Like, and I was like, this, and I was super shy, and I was like, this is like the worst experience of my life. Like, how am I going to come out of this class and tell my mom, like, I am not coming back next week? So, so I said there, it's like, I try to open my sketchbook as slowly as humanly possible, but of course, there's nothing in it because it's the first day of class. Like, what can you, like, your pencil, like, kneading your eraser, like I'm doing everything I can to stall. And remember this is in the museum, so all of the patrons are walking around watching you. So then I'm like, so I like figure if I like hold it like this, no one can see you. And, and if I draw like super light gray, no one can see what I'm drawing anyway. So they won't know if it's right or wrong or if it's good or bad. So it's painful, right? Like I'm trying to draw this light like, Aphrodite sculpture and this Adonis, right? And so I'm just thinking, like, please let this end. This is like the longest three hours of my entire life. Like, and so then the teacher says, okay, like we're gonna finish up and we're gonna have critique. And I was like, yes, this is over. No, no, no. I did not know what critique was. So she's like, okay, line up your pieces here along this bench, like in the middle of the gallery. So of course then all the people were walking around. Oh, you know, and you're like, oh, so you like run up and would like throw it and like get back so maybe no one would know which one was yours. No, no. Then she goes down like, whose piece is this? <laughs> and then it was like, and then she would make all these comments about it. It was like the most painful, excruciating experience for me because I was that little girl who was just always getting A's, like doing everything right. And I was like, I know my painting is terrible, my drawing is terrible. I don't even like this is so horrible. And and I remember her getting to my piece and saying like. 
you know, to praise all these ones they were like dark and like scribbly and like and they were all different, you know, like some were big and black and others were really distorted and like they all look terrible, but <laughs> but she was like, don't be afraid to use, you really get in there with the darks and, and you know, use that contrast. Because at the time I didn't really realize how much like you needed, like the light was, wasn't powerful without the dark. And, um, but it was so painful and so horrible and I was like, I never ever want to do this again. This is the worst thing ever. Who came up with this idea where people tell you what's wrong with your painting and your drawing? <laughs> but I came to really appreciate it as an adult. And I always use a plus delta model when I do critiques with people. Plus means what is working well in the painting, what do you like, what's bringing you joy, what do you feel you did successfully, and delta is a symbol for change. It's not a minus, it's if I were to do this over again, what might I do differently? Or what part would I still like to work on? Or what's another direction I could go with this? And I think it's a much gentler way to both approach our work as well as giving um, constructive sort of direction to someone else because a lot of times in a piece, it's fine, but there's a lot of different ways you could do it. It doesn't mean what you've done is bad. And I'm like, critique is seen through someone else's eyes. And that is a gift because they're obviously seeing things that you aren't and as from a point of connection, knowing whether or not you're conveying the message, it's fine if you only want to do work for yourself. But if you want to do work that also speaks to other people, then hearing what other people have to say helps you to communicate more effectively with them. So that is what I have to say about critique. So, so anyways, if there's any other questions, you can talk to me while I clean up. But um, hopefully that gave you some sort of insight or help or direction with your with your practice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 